Introducing The Binge, the only podcast network that will never leave you waiting for new episodes. On The Binge, you get the whole story, all episodes, all at once. Find your next podcast obsession with an ever-growing collection of thrilling true crime stories and fascinating docuseries. Plus, every month you'll get a binge drop of a brand new story that's all episodes, all at once. Ready to unlock your listening? Visit the Binge Channel page on Apple Podcasts or GetTheBinge.com and start binging today. Coming up. Michael Horvath had a, a obsessive personality and I guess was obsessed with, with Holly Grimm. For Vault Studios, I'm Will Johnson. You're listening to The Daily Crime. Almost 10 years after Holly Grimm went missing in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, the man charged with kidnapping and killing her learned his fate earlier this month. He took away everything. He took Zachary's mom. He took his sister. He took Zachary's home. He took everything. He just, you know, he took part of our lives away, too. At the meantime, he just don't realize what he took. And it's wrong. It's totally wrong. I adopted a rescue dog recently. She's the absolute best. I can't imagine my life without her. And it was incredibly important for me to research the shelter that I was getting her from. And they were great. They have the animal's best interests in mind. And they're working hard to find homes for actual rescue dogs. I really wish I didn't have to specify actual rescue dogs. But here's the thing. If you're not careful, you can be tricked when buying a dog. On the upcoming season of Smokescreen Puppy Kingpin, Host Alex Schumann investigates the story of a secretive businesswoman accused of laundering puppies. Consumers thought they were getting rescue dogs, but without knowing it, they were actually supporting animal cruelty. The woman at the center of this has made millions, supplying puppies to people across America, sometimes even selling them without disclosing that they're sick. But now she's facing multiple lawsuits. Puppy Kingpin brings to light a side of our pet industry not enough of us are talking about while unveiling some shady truths about a con artist taking advantage of it. You can subscribe to Smokescreen Puppy Kingpin on Apple Podcasts to binge all the episodes, or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. I'm joined now by Amanda Eustace, a reporter at WNEP, the news station in Pennsylvania. Amanda, thanks for being here with us. Absolutely. Well, thanks to have me back. Let's talk about what we know about what happened back in 2013 when Holly Grimm was, was murdered. This case has been going on for nearly a decade. And in 2013, investigators really didn't have much to go off of other than um, they get a call that morning um, and it's from her mother. And they say, I don't, she says, I don't know where my daughter is. I haven't heard from her. She's not answering the phone. I showed up at her house and there is just a complete mess. So the investigators come over and that's when the initial, um, the task of trying to find Holly Grimm begins. And investigators then start to question people where she worked, which was Allen Oregon Company um, in the Lehigh Valley. And that's where she was supposed to be that day, was actually at work. Um, And she obviously never showed up. And and that's part of um, why investigators began this task of looking for her. And as the investigation goes on, um, you know, it was very slow moving in the beginning just because they didn't have much to go off of. So they talk with a bunch of the co-workers, her co-workers, I should say, at Allen Oregon Company. And she was known as a bowler and she was missing for work on a Friday. And a lot of the people that she worked with said, um, you know, it, it's we're not surprised that Holly isn't here today because she typically, bowling happened on um, Thursday nights and Typically, she would take off on Fridays after the fact um, if it was a late night or something like that. So they're like, we're not super shocked that she's not here. It doesn't seem like anything's um, out of the ordinary. So after that, um, there's also investigators at her home and they're, you know, doing their criminal investigation, sifting through, um, you know, the things throughout the home, the kind of mess in the living room. There was a um, two coffee mugs that were knocked over. There was um, cigarettes that were all over the floor. There was a table that was kind of um, in an unusual position, which normally wasn't in. Um, so that's when the investigation kind of started. Um, and it really ended up taking off in in 2016 is kind of when we start to learn a lot more information because this is, was a really slow moving case in the beginning. And in 2016, my understanding is that investigators finally found 
partial remains of Holly Grimm. Yes. And those remains were found on the property of Michael Horvath. And he lived in Ross Township, which is near an area here in Pennsylvania called Sailorsburg in Monroe County. And um, Horvath was on investigators' radar prior to this. I mean, there was tons of people that were on um, the radar to, to, to kind of figure out where did Grimm go or who had communication with Grimm. Um, but what ended up coming back time and time again was Horvath's name. And they kept circling back to him and they've interviewed him multiple times. And when we were sitting throughout this trial, one of the interesting parts um, that I can remember was they actually played a recording, I believe it was in 2014, um, of Horvath and investigators talking about Holly and where they where they believe that he went and, and played a role in this. Um, and they ended up in that interview bringing up the fact that there was a blood spot or blood stain, I should say, on the back of the trailer and that blood matched Michael Horvath's. Um, so as the investigation continued to go on um, and, and Holly's, um, Holly Grimm's, I should say, remains were found on his property, he was arrested in 2016, three years after um, she went missing. And it was only partial remains. It was not even full remains. And still to this day, we, we don't know where the rest of her is. Did we learn anything more or have we learned at this point? And a lot's happened, obviously, with the trial and a verdict. But did we learn back then anything more about the relationship between Horvath and Grimm? Or was there a friendship there or much of anything? Um, so we knew, um, or I should say investigators knew, that there was some sort of relationship between Holly Grimm and Michael Horvath um, early on when they they started um, at Allen Oregon Company. Um there was a time where a washer and dryer was sold to Holly Grimm from Michael Horvath and was also dropped off and brought to the property. So Horvath was at Grimm's trailer before, helped move in. Um, I believe it was either the washer or dryer and, and help install it. Um, so they were on friendly terms it, from what it sounds like. I don't know if maybe it was just a little bit more than acquaintances, but not good buddies. Um, but they knew of each other. They had conversations. And from the trial and, and what investigators found was Michael Horvath had a, a obsessive um, personality and I guess was obsessed with, with Holly Grimm and found after they had arrested him and went through and went through his home, they had found journals of dates and times for about a year span period of him stalking Holly. And for instance, it would say something along the lines of, it would say a date and then a time, six something in the morning. And then it would say, um, light turns on in Grim trailer. And then it would say, Holly leaves to drop off her son. Holly returns at this time. So it was very detailed in its way. And, and, Horvath, in earlier, earlier interviews with investigators, had said, you know, there really wasn't much of a relationship. Yeah, I sold her a washer and dryer, but that was it. Like, there was nothing more than that. But as the investigation unfolded, as um, authorities began to go through his home after he was arrested, they found evidence that basically says otherwise. And, And so, Amanda, Michael Horvath is arrested and then facing some very serious charges. Yeah, he was facing um, criminal homicide, um, two separate kidnapping charges, abuse of corpse, um, basically obstruction of justice um, charges, as well as tampering with evidence. A Monroe County judge will decide the fate of a man charged with murdering a woman he worked with. The trial for Michael Horvath started this morning at the courthouse in Stroudsburg. Horvath is accused of killing Holly Grimm and then burying her on his property near Sailorsburg. Michael Horvath walked into the Monroe County Courthouse for the start of his bench trial. He had no comment when asked about how Holly Grimm's remains ended up buried in his backyard of his home near Sailorsburg. Michael, do you know how Holly Grimm's remains got in your backyard? No comment. And he was found guilty on criminal homicide, which obviously is the big one. That's a felony, Um, you know, and that's the worst of the worst you can really get. And um, kidnapping, 
abuse of a corpse and temp uh, tampering with evidence. But he was acquitted on the charge of obstruction, um, which is pretty interesting. But again, he did work with investigators the entire time um, and, and didn't really say, no, you can't do this. Or, no, you can't do that. He kind of gave him free range to search and ask questions and all that other stuff. And Amanda, leading up to that that guilty verdict on, on at least it sounds like the majority of the charges, right? Except that obstruction charge. This was a, a bench trial, right? Can you explain that and what that was about? Yeah. So basically a bench trial um, is when it's the verdict is up to a judge. Um, so a lot of the times in cases we see that there's a jury trial where there's deliberations and basically, you know, the, the public comes in and um, the, the 12 jurors that are selected kind of offer um, their verdict, where this was strictly a judge. And the reason why this was, um, a couple of years back, they ended up switching it from a jury trial um, to a bench trial to, to basically take off the, the death penalty aspect of it. Um, so that was pretty interesting. And, and part of the reason why it took so long to get to trial was, of course, um, we had the pandemic and that postponed tons of trials and things like that. But there was also tons of evidence um, that the Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania, the prosecution had to go through and say, okay, what are we going to submit? Um, what are we not going to submit? And kind of to fed through, feed through things that way, because there was just so much stuff that they had. Uh, so this trial started and, and lasted three weeks. Uh, the prosecution basically argued that Horvath methodically stalked, had an obsession with, um, and ultimately, you know, wanted to follow Grimm. Um, and he had the opportunity and means to. And they presented, um, you know, different witnesses, um, like forensic experts who came and checked out the scene after the lead investigators on the case um, came and gave their two cents um, in testimony to the court and the judge. Um, and then we had evidence. And there was a lot of evidence, <laughs> a ton of evidence, actually, from... Oh, goodness. Lock picking devices to chloroform to DVDs and web searches and books about um, how to chloroform a woman, how to kidnap a woman. Um, ju just very interesting stuff um, was all included in evidence. And the, the main thing that I think was really interesting um, was those journals that were found that basically showed. Um, that Horvath had stalked Grimm over that, that year's worth of period that he had journaled. Um, every movement, and it was more along the, the morning times, um, and that's kind of what fitted in with the timeline because his wife would left had left for work early, so he was able to be at the house early. So it was kind of like nobody saw them that he was missing in, in terms of the investigator's eyes. Um, the defense said, listen, there's tons of people that could, could have had it out for Grimm or, or wanted maybe Grimm dead. Um, and a big person that they continuously talked about was Kathy Horvat, which was Horvat's wife. Um, and basically she was one of the people, or I, I believe the main person, um, that found those journals within their home after Michael Horvath was arrested in 2016. Their argument was she wanted revenge. She had it out for him. She was jealous that Horvath was obsessing over and stalking over Grimm. Um, and that was kind of the main suspect that the defense tried to play into the judge's mind to say, hey, listen, there's more than one person here um, who definitely could have been at fault, and we believe it's Kathy. And then they named some other people, you know, maybe some coworkers. I believe there were two, um, you know, that weren't super fond because she was maybe always late to work that Friday. Um, after after bowling on a late Thursday night, um, but the main suspect they believe should have been Kathy in in grim slaying. But ultimately, the judge did find Michael Horvath guilty of the most serious crimes: criminal homicide, kidnapping in the first degree. And when will he be sentenced? Yeah, so he's set to be sentenced in September. Um, and you know, one of the the things that you know I kind of want to talk about was. Every day that we were at the trial, um, there was family members and friends of Holly Grimm's, and they were wearing purple T-shirts and in yellow lettering, it said uh, "Justice for Holly" on them. And you know, finally, when the trial ended, um, you could see that there was just a little bit of a sigh of relief. Um, they they were able to breathe a little bit, and we we talked with 
um, Holly's son, Zachary, who's now 24. So he might've been what, 13 or 14 at the time, all of this was happening. Um, you know, and he said, this is, this is a win for our family, but it'll, we'll never feel like we fully win one just because we don't have all of her. Amanda did, Michael Horvath's side of the story ever come up during the trial, at least what he claimed happened the day that Holly Grimm was murdered? Yes, it did. So when investigators were talking with all the co-workers, obviously, um, Michael Horvath was a co-worker of Holly Grimm and and worked at Allen Organ Company in the Lehigh Valley. And his story the day Grimm disappeared was a flat tire story. It's something that, you know, maybe we all seem to, to think of or like a dog ate your homework thing. But this Horvath said legitimately happened that he was driving to work, um, you know, got a flat tire almost three quarters of the way there, um, you know, kind of filled it up with with a little bit of air and then drove it all the way back home to be able to plug it because he had one of those plugging devices um, to kind of seal up the tire and still save the tire and be able to drive on the tire. Uh, And, you know, the Commonwealth went back and forth a lot of the time and said that his story doesn't add up with with what he's saying because GPS um, records from his phone match um, different locations as to where he was saying he was um, during that time. So that was an interesting part in the, in the trial because that kind of kickstarted and um, jumped off the the start where investigators really started to look at Horvath as a main um, suspect in, in the trial. And then ultimately um, as they did several interviews with him and learned that he had somewhat of a relationship with the washer and dryers um, side of the story, then the stalking of with the journals that they found, um, they realized that this was their guy. All right, Amanda Eustace. Well, we will wait and learn about the sentencing later this year. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us about this case. We appreciate it. Thanks, Will, for having me. Thanks for listening to The Daily Crime. Be sure to check out our weekly show, True Crime Chronicles, available wherever you listen to podcasts. For Vault Studios, I'm Will Johnson.